Is anybody seeing my screen? Yeah, I still see it with the uh, okay. LIPG. <laughs> okay. Okay. Loud cool. and clear. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Wenzel, your uh, LIPG president currently. And uh, thanks for coming out tonight. This is going to be a, a pretty interesting presentation. And if you applied for PD, uh, PDH credit, um, <clears throat> the way we do that to audit your attendance is it's going to be recorded as your <clears throat> participation. And when you hang up, um, we have a list of that as well as uh, before I introduced our speaker tonight, I'm going to give you a code that we're going to ask for you to put in the chat box at the end of the presentation so that we can verify that you stayed on and hung out with us. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, thanks again. And let me get through this here. Uh, first of all, as usual, we like to, to uh, thank our uh, corporate sponsors uh, for 2022. And at the top of the list is PW Grocer Environmental Engineering Solutions, uh, Alpha Analytical, Castleton Environmental, EnviroTrack, ERM Consulting Engineering, H2M Architects and Engineers, and Island Pump and Tank. And uh, you know, thank you. Your, your corporate sponsorship and your support um, is greatly appreciated and helps us keep things going to do things like we're doing tonight. <clears throat> A little bit about upcoming events. Uh, <clears throat> normally, our, our monthly Zoom meetings have been on the third Thursday of each month, and we've had a pretty good run here between 2021 and 2022. But uh, like most of the um, other sister organizations, we're going to take a summer hiatus for the July and August months, and uh, we'll be looking for speakers for the fall. We have none at the present time, and I make this appeal every time. You know, if you have something to present that you've already done or you'd like to do, please get in touch with us. You know, we just spend a lot of time trying to get speakers and uh you know we try to keep the content enriching and varied and uh you know you could be a part of that anyway uh instead of webinars during july and august we're going to have some field trips uh we've set up one for sunday july 30th and it's going to be a guided tour of the hall of gems in the uh, american museum of natural history and that should be pretty decent um Right now, the announcement's on the website, but it's not open for registration, so stay tuned for an email that'll come out announcing the registration is open. We're going to have groups of about 20, depending on how many people actually register and show up. We'll have a docent, and we'll get a, a nice tour uh, first thing in the morning, about 10 a.m. it'll start, and if all goes well, for those who are interested, we're going to go over to Central Park across the street and have a, you know, bring your own lunch picnic, but um, maybe look at the rocks in Central Park because there's some interesting features there also, as well as examples of uh, <clears throat> Manhattan uh, bedrock. Uh, and then on uh, the 21st of August, which is a Sunday, we're bringing back the canoe trip and picnic at the Nisiquag River State Park. Um, <clears throat> we've always had a great time doing it. It's an easy paddle. Uh, if you're not a not, you know, if you're not a great canoeer, um, we we start uh, upstream and at high tide, and we ride we ride the outgoing tides. So it can be a very pleasant trip, and we'll then pull out uh, at Nisiquag River State Park, and like we've done in the past, we'll have a picnic um, and hopefully good times. Uh, lastly, on this page, we have just you know we are an open organization. Um, you know, you can read our statement that was up on the beginning page and, and our website. So everyone's welcome to get involved, to participate, listen in on our board meetings. They're typically the first Monday of every month. Um, the next one is in July, but this year, uh, the 4th of July holiday is a Monday. So we pushed it to Thursday the 7th. If you're interested, you know, email us at lapgpres.gmail. Uh, uh, dot com and that's on the website and we can hook you up <clears throat> anyway just a little bit um, about our recognition of our other organizations uh, across the state um, you know we have the new york state council of professional geologists which um, you know has been so instrumental in so many aspects of our professional geologist licensing in october they're developing um what we're calling geology days 
and it'll be a um, couple of full days of speakers and presentations. And if you're hurting for uh, PDH credits before your renewal in 2023, this is where you could probably pick up multiple credits if you're able to attend. The uh, LIPG will be putting out an email blast with a call for papers and further announcements to support the council. Um, and then we have, we have the Buffalo Association, Central New York, uh, Hudson Mohawk, and all of those organizations like us this year take a hiatus in the summer. But I would encourage you to visit their websites because they're doing cool stuff too. And um, they're all part of the same, you know, um, set of colleagues that we have as professional, you know, geologists. And lastly, the uh, Northeast chapter of the American Institute of Professional Geologists, same thing. So, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting content out there if you just seek it out. Um, and then again, in, in the uh, Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Council of Professional Geologists always had some interesting stuff going on. So you should check out their website. Um, the um, Stony Brook University has uh, in the fall and spring semesters, they have something called geology open night lectures. And, uh, you know, obviously it's the end of the semester, so there's nothing going on there, but just want to make you aware of it and uh, check out their website come September, because uh, I bet you they'll have two or three really interesting talks there. And you can attend, uh, last I knew, virtually or in person. A um, couple points about the ASBOG. If you're seeking a professional geologist, license in New York. You have to, at this point, take the ASBOG exam, both sections of it, and pass it. Um, the next test is in October, but if you haven't registered, you've missed that deadline. So your next opportunities are in March and October of 2023. And you can see here that the uh, deadlines for submittal of the applications are shown here as the end of December and the end of July. You can find more out at uh, asbog.org. Enough of me, um, let's get on to the main event. And I would ask that participants, please write this down. This code, PDH code up here, LIAPG-225. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our speaker. It's Dr. Paul Grosser from PW Grosser Consulting. And his presentation tonight is on natural disaster resiliency, looking at planning, investment, and recovery. And we are pleased and thankful that he has volunteered his time to make this presentation. So with that, I'm gonna switch out and let him start sharing. Okay. We, um, so I share my screen then? Yes. Correct. You should be able to pull up a bar and has a share screen in green. In green. Yep. Um, yep. Let's see what happens here. Two. There you go. You're in. I'm in. You're in. Okay, good. Awesome. <clears throat> Just got to look at what screen I'm talking to. That's all. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, thank you all for attending because I know we're competing with the Yankee game tonight. So uh, we'll, we'll try and work our way. I know Jen doesn't care too much because uh, she's a Mets fan, but some other people do. Um, so we're going to talk about this natural disaster resiliency, planning, investment, recovery. It's kind of a, um, a very broad look at how do we address largely climate change and things that are happening in our environment these days. Um, to more to, to mitigate these things and, and what kind of program we have. Um, what does this have to do with geology? Um, first off, the, you see the portion on the, on your, on the left-hand side, that's um, Fukushima in Japan, the tsunami, the result of an earthquake. So earthquakes fall under geology. Um, some of the, we'll be talking about flooding, uh, and hurricanes and, and wildfires as well. Um, and geology is involved in a lot of the mitigation for these. Um, many times we're dealing with, with groundwater questions, uh, particularly in flooding and how do we protect a, um, something that's critical infrastructure and uh, make sure that the groundwater doesn't come up when the flood comes up. And, and do we properly design those uh, things? And we'll, we'll talk about 
some levee design in New Orleans and how they failed uh, and, and the geology of that aspect as well. So there's lots to do. It is, it's a very broad field where you have a lot of different people um, working on the projects. And it's not just technical aspects, it's also social and um, environmental, you know, des design issues uh, that are not just clear cut in one area of expertise. So you're gonna have a, a big group of people working on these things from, from different points of view. So let's go on to the next slide. Hopefully this will work here. Uh, that didn't go, did it? No, try just using your down arrow on your keyboard. Down arrow. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Looking at, you know, a whole list of hurricanes, um, going back to Katrina um, and up through Tropical Storm Arthur, which was a couple of years ago. We're coming into another hurricane season. So a um, whole bunch of, and, and huge damages, you know, $125 billion dollars. With Katrina, where it largely you know wiped out uh, New Orleans and made it non-habitable for, for a period of time, and uh, we'll talk about that. You know, certainly no superstorm Sandy, um, which hit this area here, uh, and the impact it had, <clears throat> and it's, it's changed our whole concept of how we protect New York City, Long Island, <clears throat> New Jersey coast against these types of storms, and. One of the unique things we're finding about these, these storms now is that they're, they're changing in their characteristics. Um, you know, used to know, you know, Hurricane Gloria um, back in the 80s or, or some of the other earlier storms we used to have on Long Island. Generally, they would blow through pretty quickly. So they would come through in, you know, four to six hours. Um, <clears throat> high winds, a lot of rain, uh, some storm surge. But it, it, they would go through quickly. The, the storms we're seeing now, uh, the Katrinas, the Sandy, we know, um, Irma, which hit um, the Bahamas, um, they would hang in this spot for days. Sandy was with us for pretty much two days. Um, and that's several tidal cycles. So you don't get a chance for the tide to go out. It's still up. And then another tidal rush comes in. So we had significant um, coastal flooding. Um, so that's the concerns we're having these days. The, the characteristics of the storms are changing as well as uh, the frequency of the storms. And we, we've got to adjust to that as we, as we look to mitigate these things and protect our shorelines and, and protect our people and protect our critical infrastructure. So, we, so hurricanes are a big thing. We'll be talking about that. Tsunamis. Um, Huge damages. Fukushima was $199 billion. Uh, both Fukushima and Indonesia, thousands of people lost their lives. Um, you can see the devastation uh, on the right hand slot afterwards. And um, the one on the left is you see the uh, essentially the tidal wave coming in in Indonesia. And, you know, it just wiped out entire communities and people didn't have a chance. So, you know, how do we protect against these things? Um, and, you know, and part of that is prediction and preparedness. And any of these things, we'll be talking about that as an aspect to it. Wildfires, that's a result of climate change. We're seeing um, change in precipitation. So the West Coast is getting hit particularly bad, very dry, windy uh, situations where uh, anything can start a fire in, in large areas where they have you know, large treed areas, um, undeveloped tracks, and these fires get going and they, they just don't stop. In addition to that, you've got, you know, in addition to the, the loss from the fire itself, you have uh, smoke uh, and, you know, impacting people's health. Um, you know, I've been up in uh, Seattle when they were having the fires in Canada and the smoke was blowing down into Seattle and, you know, you had a hard time breathing there and you can see the smog uh, resulting from those wildfires. So really significant impact. Flooding, this is um, storms, you know, bring large amounts of rainfall, 
Ohio, the Ohio River in 2018. Uh, if you remember Boston and Cape Cod, they had a nor'easter hit and uh, had significant flooding there. And in uh, South Carolina, relative to Hurricane Florence, they had dam failures, which exacerbated the problem uh, of the hurricane themselves. So um, you gotta be, they gotta be prepared for these things. The dams have to be reevaluated for the, for the new types of storms we're gonna find. So um, critical problems. And then we throw in COVID, which is uh, not necessarily you know, climate change, but it is something we've had, we have to deal with as um, designers and engineers and geologists. It's gonna change how we operate. It's changed how we've all operated working remotely more um, and, and how things get designed and how we plan for things in the future to give people more space so they're not all crowded into one spot. Um, current fatalities due to COVID is, is in the United States is over a million people now. Um, and it keeps, keeps climbing, not as bad as it was, but still. And globally, it's 6.33 million people. So huge impact on um, you know, people and, and, and people's ways of lives. Some of the things we're looking at as far as changes as a result of COVID um, is new de design criteria for HVAC systems and buildings. So buildings are gonna be designed differently. Your, your office layouts are gonna be designed differently um, <clears throat> to allow more space and, and to allow people to uh, work remotely. And then the social distancing regulations and policies where you're gonna see, you know, urban design will be wider sidewalks, uh, providing dining areas and, and roads and sidewalks, converting streets and to, to plazas. Uh, people who have been to Europe, you, you know, you go to the town center and there's a big plaza and there's restaurants off it with seating on the side and, and lots of space. And uh, not like, you know, we go to New York City and it's, square block after square block of uh, narrow roads and uh, very little sidewalk space. So, so you're gonna see things changing as a result of, uh, of, of COVID as well. So it's, it's the whole process of looking at um, how we address these issues and, and mitigate them and try and uh, keep society moving along as, as we go. Let's talk about the resiliency cycle. This is a, a continual cycle that we go through um, and it's a continual learning cycle. As, as we'll talk later on, as, as things change, we got to keep adapting. So uh, generally, you're starting out with, with some kind of preparedness. And we all think we're prepared for these things. Uh, you know, you get a warning there's going to be a hurricane, and you go out and you buy batteries, and you get some ice maybe, and you stock up on milk and eggs, and uh, you're going to be good. If you're in a low-lying area, you may have um, you know, been using sandbags like we show in the preparedness area. And that was common use flood areas use the same thing you know in, in the river areas with levees uh you'll see people getting getting sandbags okay so the first thing to do is to be prepared for whatever happens and that also is um having a plan you know, what are we gonna do how do we evacuate when do we evacuate what do we need to do uh, as we go along um so so it's being prepared at the beginning, having a plan. And then when the event happens, to some extent as with any plan, it kind of goes out the window because the, the storm or the event that you have is not always exactly what you plan for. It's not wine, it's cranberry juice. And um, so what, I, I always um, kind of characterize it as, you know, you talk about the generals are always fighting the last war. In um, these situations, you're always planning as if the last storm is gonna be the, your next storm. And that's not really the case. You gotta be prepared for that. You gotta look and have some foresaw, forethought into what that next storm is gonna look like. It's not gonna be like, you know, Sandy was a unique storm. It was a coastal flooding event. It wasn't a lot of high winds. We didn't get a lot of rain but we did get two days of coastal flooding and it inundated a lot of areas. The next storm could be a hurricane that blows through with 110, 150 mile an hour winds and, and go through in six or eight hours, but have a, still have a pretty significant storm surge uh, and, a lot, and a lot of rain. So you're designing for a completely different 
situation where the, the water is coming from the other direction. It's going from the highlands to the bay as opposed to coming from the bay towards the highlands. So, so you have to uh, be prepared with a response and, and you try and respond to that particular storm. After it is clean up, okay, we gotta, we gotta clean up this mess, um, get rid of debris, um, you know, clear out streams from, from trees and, and things like that. So there's gotta be a plan for that. And how, how are we gonna do that effectively? And then it's reconstruction. Uh, you see on the, the top two slides on those buildings, they're essentially buildings that were are flooded out in the coastal area. And the reconstruction is, is following the FEMA guidelines, which sets the finished floor elevate, first floor, finished floor elevation of you know, maybe 10, 13 feet, something like that, uh, depending on the, the rating of the storm. Is it going to be a 100-year storm, a 500-year storm, uh, and the like? So raising up properties when you rebuild them uh, is, is the thing to do. And then also included with that is the next slide, which is the robust infrastructure, where you see the floodgates. That's the floodgates on the uh, Midtown Tunnel. And if you go by there, you see their position um, in, the, in an open position. And when the, there's a flood coming along, a coastal storm or a hurricane, they'll be able to shut those gates to prevent the tunnel from flooding out. Um, so that's a result of Sandy. So that was the response to the last storm. Okay, we had we flooded out the, sub, the subway tunnels and the, uh, the the car tunnels, so we'll protect them. Okay, next storm we'll have to see what what's what's going to happen. But so then you go back to another cycle again. Okay, your preparedness now is going to be your plan is okay. We're going to shut the floodgates. We're going to. Uh, be able to handle it with our new structures and then see what happens. Um, a really good example, we did some work for Staten Island Hospital um, and they have a situation there when the water gets to the front door, it's too late because they're, they're kind of like, they, they become an island. So when the water's at the front door, to get out of the building, you've got to go through eight feet of water. So if you're gonna evacuate that building, you've got to plan on evacuating way in advance. And you've got to make a decision of, do I evacuate or do I, do I um, stay in place and, and um, honker down and, and wait the storm out? <clears throat> Real tough decision. You really, really good um, predictions on what's gonna happen. Um, but a decision has to be made and that's gotta be part of your plan. And you've gotta be prepared to evacuate people at some point, and that's not an easy thing uh, for a hospital. So let's, let's talk about what's going on with climate change. These are a number of plots. Um, they show one, first one shows temperature, right? And zero is essentially the long-term average. And this goes back to 1850 to the present. And you can see there's been a steady increase in, in the temperature. Um, it's like, you know, if you look at groundwater monitoring data or anything like that, it does change, you know, it jumps up and down, but you can see there is a steady trend to it. And it, that trend appears to be um, accelerating as we come into since 1975 or something like that. Uh, higher than average and accelerating faster than it was in the past. Same with the sea surface temperature uh, and marine air temperatures. So it's clearly an increasing trend here. At, at what point is human influence? The, you know, is it 1950? Is it 1965? I think it, it's, a, it's a gradual thing, but you're, you're clearly seeing um, an impact here. We're looking at sea level here, similar type of uh, situation where you can see compared to the average, it's increasing now relatively steadily and um, accelerating a little bit. But um, you know that's looking at the past. And then the summer Arctic sea ice, you're seeing that decline. Uh, 
pretty significantly since about 1950. Um, part of you know, sea level rise is a combination of one is glaciers melting, but probably the biggest uh, factor in it is the temperature rise and the um, coefficient of expansion for water. So as the temperature rises, the water itself expands. So that creates sea level rise in itself. So it's not just melting of glaciers that's adding additional water to the system. It's the expansion of the sea uh, of the water as well. Here's, here's now, here we're looking at the future. You know, these are projections for temperature. These are, you know, a number of different models are out there. Um, depending on the assumptions you make, you know, it's, um, and you can see the variation once you get out past you know, 2050 or so is pretty significant as these models kind of diverge depending on, on what assumptions you make for that time. Um, you know, if you can, if you can uh, hold the line with some of the global warming, you, know, you can flatten it out. If you don't, it's, it's going to increase. So, uh, and, and you can see significant variation from, you know, from about one degree Celsius to four on the average, and maybe up to five plus uh, on an extreme assumptions. So uh, significant concern and enough to, to say that something's going on and we're gonna have to deal with it. Here's probably one of the more significant ones, projections for sea level rise, particularly for Long Island coastal areas. Um, and, and you know the variation is once you get out of 2100 is uh, you know eight tenths of a meter. So we're talking you know two and a half feet, 30 inches, right? Uh, thereabouts. And that's a, that's a pretty significant sea level rise. And that's average. So what you see and what we're seeing now is areas that would get inundated maybe a couple of times a year on an extremely full moon tide um, where everything aligns right, now are getting inundated every month or a couple of times a month. So th these low lying coastal areas we're seeing that effect. <clears throat> so this is, this is the times are changing slide. Um, as engineers, when we were taught hydrology, um, we looked at what, we, what they call stationarity. Essentially, you looked at the past and assumed the future was going to be the same as the past. So um, a hundred year storm, you looked at a hundred years worth of data and the highest storm in that hundred years, you called the hundred year storm. Long Island, you know, this was typically uh, the Hurricane of 38, which was the highest coastal flooding event that was recognized at that time. And you're saying, okay, that occurred in 1938 and it's gonna, a storm like that's gonna occur um, it's got a 1% kind of chance of occurrence in any given year. And that's what, that's a hundred year storm. One over a hundred, 1% is one over a hundred, which is a hundred year storm. Okay. Now we're looking at things much differently. Uh, this is the new paradigm. That mean isn't staying the same. It's changing. It's increasing with time. So we've got an increasing trend. So when we look at the future, okay. we've got- Now, where count. was that? When we um, look to the future, we've got to account for that trend. And the problem is we don't really know exactly what that trend is. You saw those models and they give very different answers. So um, we've got to find a way to deal with that. Okay, so what used to be the 500 year storm may now be the 100 year storm. Um, and, and that's the challenge that, we, that we've got. How, how do we really come up to deal with that? And you know, New York State, uh, you know, DEC is projecting up to a 20% increase in rainfall in the eastern portion of the state uh, as we go into the future. Well, that's a that's a lot of rain. You know, that's you know, we get 40 inches or 44 inches, so 20%, you know, 10 more inches of rain on the average. That's pretty significant. That's going to have an impact on groundwater levels. 
um, going to have an impact on how we design stormwater systems, uh, how we control stormwater. Um, like, so it's significant impacts that we've got to deal with as we, as we look towards the future. So um, we're going into an area that's kind of unknown on, on projecting what's going to happen in the future. And then we've got to design for things that we don't know what's going to happen and hope it works. So let's look at um, prioritizing resiliency efforts. Uh, a number of factors go into that. Essentially, we, we want to know, you know, do we protect everyone? Do we protect, what, what do we protect? We protect crit critical infrastructure. We protect certain roads. What, what, what do we protect? Uh, and people, you know, is the most important thing. So when we look, we look at the scale of the impact, um, you know, we did some work for um, affordable housing in, in um, the Rockaways, for instance, and in, actually in downtown Manhattan as well. Um, high rise buildings that all of a sudden are inundated during Sandy. And uh, it's not just the floodwaters, but it knocks out the power, uh, knocks out the elevators, knocks out um, people's access to, to get to. So, you know, we, we look at, you know, so there you're going to have a significant scale of impact compared to a less populated area um, where, where it won't be such a, such a great impact. The duration of the impact, you know, that was kind of the Sandy thing. Is this two days, three days? Um, and then the lingering impacts afterwards, okay, you know, it knocked out all this critical infrastructure. Now, you know, how do we get our sewers back online? How do we find gasoline to, to run our, our vehicles? And, you know, and, and what happened to all those vehicles that got flooded out? Um, so that duration of impact becomes a significant concern. How long are people going to be subjected to these situations? And then the likelihood of impact. This is, this is the 100 year storm, the 500 year storm. Um, what's going to happen, you know, as far as these events occurring? And then the vulnerability is how vulnerable are these locations to these types of storms? If you're on the shoreline, you know, if you're on Rockaway Beach and a you know, 20 story high rise, you're pretty vulnerable. And uh, so you've got pretty good scale of impact, uh, pretty likely, good likelihood of impact because you're in that coastal zone and, you, and you're extremely vulnerable because of your location. So you, we look at each of these factors in trying to essentially triage how we're going to go and um, spend money to, to protect what we're, and what we're going to protect. So. Um, and that's part of the, the equation we go into. Identifying critical infrastructure. Hospitals. You know, we're working for Good Sam Hospital right now on, on a resiliency project. Uh, right, on, right on Great South Bay. With, in the, in the canal comes up, it's in a flood zone, pretty much. Um, Southside Hospital, same thing. Canal's right across the street. Doing sandy waters came up to Montauk Highway and, and came across. Um, power plants, many of them are in uh, low-lying zones. A lot of these facilities were placed where they're placed because the property was cheap. They were, they were placed on marshes. So um, Village of Freeport has a power plant right on the water, and it is on top of what was a landfill at one point. So it was a marsh. They filled it and then uh, decided to put a power plant there, extremely vulnerable location to flooding. Water and wastewater treatment as well. You know, Bay Park sewage treatment plant, right on the water. It was built on an old marsh. Same with Cedar Creek. Um, when the tide comes up, they have problems. They had, you know, Bay Park was put out of commission uh, during Sandy. High density housing was what I was talking about there. Transportation networks. How do we protect, you know, Montauk Highway or major artery roads uh, from being flooded out? And how do we divert people? Uh, during these floods, is invariably someone decides they're going to drive into what they think is a shallow puddle, and it's a lot deeper than they thought. So uh, that's the kind of critical infrastructure we're looking at. Much less so, you know, residential housing and things like that, where you can kind of evacuate people relatively easy, and, and you're going to have losses. Uh, but the cost of those losses and, and overall dollars and, and planning concepts are not as high. So we look at this risk analysis, and uh, it's essentially the cost of resiliency 
should be less than the cost of the damage times the probability of the damages. For example, Hurricane Katrina, we had $125 billion of uh, damage. The probability of that storm we were saying was 0.02, so that's a 50-year storm. So the cost of resiliency should be less than about two and a half billion dollars. Well, you start thinking about that. Two and a half billion dollars is, is a lot, and that's you could spend that every year for 50 years. And if you protect that, if you protect New Orleans for that, you're ahead of the game. <clears throat> and obviously that escalates the, the with, with inflation that 125 billion ain't what it used to be. So um but that's how we analyze this to look at how much money we should be putting towards resiliency and can be able to justify. This is an example we have is um, the failure of the, of the levee in, in New Orleans. And this was a, a horrible failure happened in Katrina. And, and unfortunately, um, it was it flooded out a, a neighborhood. Um, you know, lower income um, area that um, was vulnerable and, and many people died. This is where you saw people cutting holes through their roof so they could get out of the house because the, the floodwaters had come through and it comes through so rapidly with a, with a catastrophic failure that uh, you don't have time to get away. And, and they, people weren't properly warned and it wasn't, you know, Quite frankly, we'll talk about it, it wasn't properly designed uh, for the situation, but this, this is our case study here. So this is the levee system that they have there. The river is the Mississippi River and they build a levee and here's where the geology comes in. They have this eye wall, which goes into the levee and then goes down um, <clears throat> into the natural soil um, beneath it to a certain extent. Okay, and then there's a um, sheet pile that's part of that wall. So when the river's at the normal level, it, um, it's fine, it's behind the levee, things are okay. Now this levee was designed by the Corps of Engineers and design, design was a hundred year storm. And what happened was they said, okay, this thing is designed so when the water gets to the top of the sheet pile, to the top of this eye wall, um, that's the hundred year storm. If it gets more than the hundred year storm, well, it's gonna go over the top. Uh, but we're only designing to a hundred year storm. So if it goes over the top, that's, that's not our design criteria, okay? So what happens is the situation with a hundred year storm, it gets to the top. Problem is Katrina was more than a hundred year storm <clears throat> in this, as far as the river was concerned, okay? So when it went over the top, the water cascaded down the other side of the eye wall. And they did not do anything on the backside of the eye wall to protect the eye wall from the water coming down the other side. To do it properly, you would put some uh, cladding in the back. So you put stone riprap and things like that so it wouldn't erode away. But what happened was it came over the wall, down the side, and eroded behind the eye wall to the extent where the eye wall then was, was no longer able to sustain the forces of, of the river and collapsed. So, and you had a catas catastrophic failure as this wall just rotated to the left, you know, counterclockwise and, and uh, collapsed, then inundating the entire area with pretty much, you know, from the bottom of the river to the top of the river uh, with, with, with a flood wall, with flood um, inundation. So that's where you see that, that water's coming across the levee and it just completely wiped out the area. Um, like I said, many people died and it, and it lets the water in back behind the levee, flooded out the rest of the, the city as well. Um, pumps failed, uh, you know, com complete disaster. And it was, you know, proper design would have mitigated a lot of it. Proper maintenance of, this, they have a, a bunch of 
uh, stormwater pumps in New Orleans, that would have, if they were properly maintained, and uh, they, that would have also mitigated the situation. They had a number of failures, and then they lost power, and a lot of these pumps wouldn't operate because they're electrical pumps. So um, the, your plan has to be well thought out. Uh, otherwise, you can have some very serious circumstances. Okay. Um, so this is a list of design considerations. You got flooding from rivers, you got coastal flooding, you got rainfall, you've got wind. Okay, you can have, um, well, yeah, you know, for a hurricane, you can have uh, six, six out of the seven, right, um, happen, probably not having a wildfire, but you've got groundwater rising, uh, loss of power. So if you've got facilities with, you know, running off electricity, that, that could be lost. So you got to have your own on-site generators, uh, that type of thing. You know, everyone who's here through Sandy knows how, how long their house was out of power uh, and whether they had a generator or not, or whether they borrowed someone's and plugged in for a few hours to keep the refrigerator going. So, uh, so you've got to look at all of those different things that can happen uh, in, in protecting your critical infrastructure. Um, and, and same thing, you know, with wildfires, a little different thing. We're not used to it here. Uh, but out west, they've got to worry about, okay, where am I citing things, uh, facilities that may be subject to wildfire and can we protect against it? Um, the slide you see is essentially what they're calling the, the big U, protection of southern Manhattan. And um, essentially, it's a seawall going up um, with parkland between the seawall and the a river, both, both the Hudson River and the East River. And so when they come up and level, they, they allow that parkland to flood. And then it gets to a certain point where it hits the, the seawall uh, where they're protecting it. And they're in the process of building that right now. Um, they've got some interesting floodgates they're constructing uh, at entrances to the FDR Drive. Uh, you can see presentation on that and things. So um, it's a plan and, you know, and with any plan, you've got to understand its limitations. And if it's going to get something that's going to overtake your plan, you've got to have plan B um, on, on how to get out. You know, we did the work we did for Good Sam Hospital. Um, we originally did a design for essentially a 10 foot flood design. And the town said, no, you're not going to put up a six foot wall around the hospital. Um, but with that 10 foot design, we could put a flood wall around the hospital and actually keep the entire hospital operating during the most severe storms that we could see. Um, so now we had to reduce it. So we reduced it to an eight foot elevation flood wall. But when we did that, it changed the whole plan, right? We'll, you'll see a little bit later, we have a slide, but the, um, they have a nursing home closer to the water that had to be, you know, when you got to eight feet, that had to be evacuated or had to be evacuated anyway because you couldn't get to it during the storm. So the plan now became rather than being able to continue to operate, now when the storm comes, the nursing home will go to evacuate because you're not going to be able to get people to and from it during the storm. And then the main hospital, um, you would be able to, to operate because you could have access uh, for this lesser storm. But you have to remember if the storm is going to be more than that eight feet, you're going to have to evacuate the hospital as well. Um, the idea for the eight foot for the nursing home was that you could evacuate and then come back immediately afterwards and everything is intact and operable. And they have a generator set that can handle the whole thing. So if they lost outside power, they could do that as well. Okay, here's, you know, these are the design considerations. Um, design, design flood elevation is the DFE. The base flood elevation is the BFE. The base flood elevation we pick as, say, a 100-year storm or a 500-year flood. For hospitals, um, FEMA's requirement is a, is a minimum of 500-year flood design. So, uh, that's your starting point, right? Another way to look at it was the flood of record, record plus four feet. So we looked at Sandy 
uh, plus four feet. And you, and you list all of these, you know, okay, you look at Florida record plus four feet, you look at what the 500 year is, the 100 year storm plus five feet, okay? And then that gives you your, your base flood. Then you've got to look at, okay, what wave action is there going to be? And then what uncertainty you have? And we ran a number of these um, called swamp models where uh, you could have storms come into the New York bite from different directions and different categories and see how they would impact the location you were on. So uh, there's you know, some uh, analysis that's done on this and um, you keep going. This is the, the flood inundation from Sandy. Uh, this is a good same hospital. So on the right-hand side is the Great South Bay. And on the left-hand side is Montauk Highway. And you can see from the right-hand side, there's canals that go up into the communities there. These, all these residential communities got flooded out very severely. Um, the white top building, you see, you can see some baseball fields just underneath those baseball fields. That's the nursing home at Good Sam Hospital. Uh, so that was, the water was essentially at their doorstep there. And then further to the left, the big black area is the hospital itself and the parking. And you can see that did not get inundated. Um, so they're in the process of upgrading their um, backup generating systems because they did lose power and they, they had a hard time keeping up with what they had. So they had to upgrade that. This is an example of uh, green infrastructure design. Um, this is down in Florida, off the uh, Indian River Lagoon. And here they have, so the water that you see is the Indian River Lagoon. And then they have what you call it mangroves. And the mangroves grow down into the water and are, are very good in the coastal community. So they're very good at breaking up wave action um, that they would come across in a, in a storm. Then you can see there's the armoring of the slope with the stone. Yeah, that's pretty heavy duty stone. And, and the elevation rises as you uh, come back. To, and that the grass area is above the FEMA flood elevation. So you can see the building there, you see how close it is to, to the edge. Uh, but that first floor is right there. And that's, um, I think, I don't know, it's 12 or 13 foot elevation or something like that. So uh, it's above that FEMA elevation, so they didn't have to raise it up above that. And this, this is a pretty good, you know, using natural um, vegetation to, to buffer the storm. Uh, you're cladding so you don't get erosion of, of your uh, bank and then um, getting the elevation up for the housing. That's that. Um, the only other thing I, I wanna mention is, you know, it's the social aspects of it. Um, we go back to the design, the um, architectural design of buildings to make them more uh, community friendly. So people know their neighbors um, is really important because when you get into one of these high density housing situations, it's really important when you're gonna evacuate to know that Mrs. Jones on the 12th floor, she's got a walker or a wheelchair and she's, she can't get around easily. And, um, you know, if you, you're, not, you're not gonna have use of the elevators during the storm. So someone's gotta know that. And, you know, firemen will go up there and, you know, carry her down and things like that. But they've gotta know she's there and she, they've gotta know that she's got those kind of situations. So the more community type things they have, community spaces where people get to know each other and know their neighbors is, is really an important thing. So um, it's, it's not just the engineering, it's not just the geology or the te technology, it's also the, uh, the social aspects of well, of uh, protecting people. <clears throat> With that, we'll open it up to uh, any questions you have or discussion. If anybody wants to um, uh, unmute themselves, they can ask a question verbally or they can type it into the chat box and I'll read it out loud. Uh, in the meantime, there were two comments at the beginning. Um, Chris, in case you didn't see it, uh, Rich Baldwin said that he might be able to give a talk on offshore wind. Uh, we also had a comment, and I'm sorry if I butcher your name, from Paul uh, 
D. Annabelle. Uh, Air and Waste Management Association of Eastern New York also offers PDHs, and he provided the link for that if you scroll all the way up in the uh, chat box. Um, I actually have a question if uh, I'll, I'll start it off. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people have seen the footage from uh, what's happening in Yellowstone right now uh, with the Yellowstone River uh, flooding mm -hmm. and taking out large swaths of the infrastructure that's there. Um, I just drove through there last year. It was beautiful. Um, one of the things I heard in, on some of the news reports is they're not thinking in terms of you know, when the water goes down, we replace the roads that have been washed out. It was more along the lines of, do we replace the roads that mm -hmm. have washed out? You know, well, how, do, how do we deal with this in the future? And, you know, I'm, I'm going back and forth on that. You know, I love having the road next to the river. It's, it makes it a nice, beautiful scenic uh, drive. You know, mm -hmm. in terms of property damage, it's a little bit minimal. Uh, human health, uh, human life is not as much at risk for something like that. How do you weigh the, the, the difference between, you know, an, a coastal community that's in danger versus a scenic drive? <laughs> yeah, well, that goes into the, <clears throat> into the numbers there on, uh, you know, uh, how much you're willing to spend to make it less vulnerable, to, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, FEMA has this policy of, you know, re essentially replacing kind or had their policy. They're starting to relook at that and you get back to it's, you know, the build it back better, but it's not, you know, the bill it's, but that's the mantra is how do we build these things back so that they're more resilient um, in the future? You don't have these situations. And yeah, that's what you're going to get. People love to have a nice cabin right along the side of the stream, you know, and you can go out there and you can do some fly fishing and it's so bucolic and everything else rather than having to, to hike up, you know, 50 or 100 feet higher um, and, and build there where it's a little bit more of a pain in the neck and, you know, not as nice. That's, that's what you have to, the kind of way, you know, you have that at, on Fire Island, the same thing. Um, you know, people in the 30s and 40s, 1930s and 1940s, you know, put beach shacks out there and they were kind of, you know, okay, we got to rebuild it next spring after the Nor'easters, we'll, we'll deal with it. Now those houses are, you know, a little bit more extravagant, you know, and millions of dollars in value. And okay, now still in the same spot as the beach cottage was, beach house, but um, a lot more at stake. So it's a, it's a decision that's got to get made. It's, it's not easy. Yep. All right. Uh, we had a comment from uh, Paul Fryer. Thank you for the thought provoking presentation. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth Limbrecht from, uh, it got cut off a little bit. I think it said NJEDA. Uh, how different were the predicted flood elevations that were based on the different formulas? Parentheses, previous floods plus uh, four feet versus 500 year, et cetera. We, um, we originally, we designed, at, see, see a good Sam, right? So that design elevate, the original design elevation was 10. And that was based upon, uh, a, a, it was looking at Sandy, I think Sandy plus four feet or something, looking at these swap models um, and adding some to it. Um, when we cut it back to eight, we were still higher than a 500 year storm that FEMA would recognize. recognize. So, they, you know, there was a, a few feet of different and few feet make a big, or a big deal, you know, particularly if you're putting up a, some kind of seawall or something like that, you know, you abstract. We went from a six foot wall around the property to a two, essentially a two foot wall very close to the building because the building was on a little higher ground. So, so we pulled the wall in, tied it to the building. We said, we're going to evacuate. And if you're in the parking lot, you know, good luck to you. Speaking of higher ground, uh, Olivia Miller uh, recommended a podcast from WSHU uh, called Higher Ground, uh, where they do a nice job of discussing the local issues around climate change, particularly the social conflicts. You can find that on the WSHU.org website. Uh, we had several other 
Thanks. Uh, great presentation. All right. Anybody else have any comments? Um, okay. Uh, Vinny Racanello has a comment. Hi, Vinny. Uh, New Orleans is below sea level already. Mm -hmm. How much does this impact its susceptibility to sea level rise? Or are they better off because they already have levees in place? Well, the, the, um, the levees are designed for that 100-year storm. <clears throat> and now, as it changes, it's, it's going to be inadequate design. So they're, they've, they've reevaluated it since Katrina, I know, um, and, and have been building back better with, with higher levees, reinforcing the pumping, stormwater pumping capacity and things like that. But yeah, if, if fighting against the tide when you're below sea level um, certainly doesn't help the situation. All right. Any other questions or comments? And feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to say hi to Paul. Oh, there's one. Yep. Uh, we have another comment, or I'm sorry, question from uh, Paul Fryer. Can you offer any insights into how kelp farming may play a role in coastal resilience and um, its viability for different areas around the island? Well, could you repeat the question? I missed some of it. Sure. Uh, can you offer any insights into how kelp farming? Oh, kelp play? farming. Oh, yep. okay. Um, I, I think they're looking at kelp farming more for nitrogen loading on on the uh, estuaries and you know the, the bays. Um, certainly, um, having viable wetlands helps the situation. It helps in cutting down wave action. Because you know the, the waves can't develop in shallow water, the the, um, the marshlands themselves um, help break up that wave action. When the tide comes in, though, to eight feet higher than the marsh, it, it, you know it doesn't make the tide any lower than it was before. So in some in certain search, marginal search situations, it can help, and every every little bit helps. Um, the kelp farming, you know, uh, oyster culturing and, and bringing clams in all helps reduce the nitrogen, which helps keep those marshlands uh, viable. There is, is a big, there's a lot, there's no silver bullet in this deal. Uh, every little bit helps. Okay, hey, any more hey, questions? Yeah, Jen, I've got a question or maybe a discussion. Um, oh, after Sandy, I, I, I have several friends who lived in the South Shore, and uh, <clears throat> one of my neighbors is a home improvement contractor. And uh, I found it not interesting but disturbing that a lot of people on the South Shore whose homes were inundated did not have the proper flood insurance. So they were given grants from, you know, taxpayer money. They were given free money to house their houses, to have their houses raised. Um, and a good friend of mine who had proper insurance is to this day still waiting um, to have her house back. She's since moved out because it was futile and she's paying taxes on her old house. Anyway, it's a whole whole thing. Um, what's, the, what, what, what's the thinking? You, do, can you offer any insight into what's the thinking behind um, the government of our state using our dollars, yours and mine, to give free money to people who didn't have proper insurance. I mean, I would love to have a house on the shore, um, but when I moved to Long Island, I did a phase one site assessment on my own. I looked at the where the water table was, and I looked at the flood maps, and I made sure I wasn't in danger. Yet people who have homes where they can keep a boat and have, you know, shoreside property, uh, get free money to raise their houses and rebuild. I just don't, I, I never understood that. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. 
Don't ask me how to figure out how the government operates. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't asking that's, that. That's why I'm an engineer. <laughs> I just wanted your I just wanted your opinion, Paul. Yeah, yeah um, you know, it's whoever can scream the loudest and the politicians is that what it know, is? they have to help them out. They'll do, you know. Um I, I agree with you. You know, my philosophy, you know, like you've got these houses on Fire Island, which is clearly vulnerable to everything. And you know. And I figured if I had a house on Fire Island, I, that's the risk you take. You know. Yeah, I've often wondered why the permits are given to build homes on the barrier islands and near the South Shore. Um, obviously, if you ask a geologist, they're going to say absolutely not. You can't build a house there. Yeah. Um, but they do, and the taxpayers <laughs> end up paying for it, so it's... Well, that's the problem, know. Tom. They don't ask the geologist. <laughs> that's the problem. They don't ask the geologist. You're right. Well, and you know what was a big uh, kind of unintended consequence of the insurance and you know that you're talking about, Tom, is when you rebuild. Um, it hurt a lot of people. Is you they couldn't rebuild the illegal apartments in the basements, which were a major, in, uh, a major source of income for a lot of people so even though they were rebuilding they couldn't rebuild the illegal so it's just it's a incredibly complicated um, well if you can't rebuild an illegal apartment i call that a good thing yeah i would think so <laughs> okay um, I, I just thought i'd throw that thought out there because you know we're all geologists um many of us professional and uh i've always thought it was a shame that the local governments do not consult us more than they should be when they're handing out permits. Anyway, I just thought somebody might have an opinion on that. I gave this talk in South Carolina and, you know, they have barrier beaches there as well. And one is, you know, they don't believe a lot in global warming down there anyway. <laughs> no uh, kidding. And, and, and there's a political reason for it because all these developers and builders kind of rely on them not being built back to FEMA. They want to be back, build it back as it was, so I can replace it again in another 10, 15 years uh, because it's going to get knocked down. And they've got a lot of political clout in the state capitol and yeah. what's going on. And they, they, the people I was talking to, a bunch of engineers said, that's exactly, you got to talk to them because that's exactly what they're doing and that's exactly why they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem if people want to build on these areas, but I shouldn't have to pay for it, I guess mm -hmm. is my, my complaint. But yeah. anyway, I just thought I wondered if you had any thoughts on it, but thank you. Sure. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. All right, uh, we have another question from somebody with the unique I name of uh, name of iPad. Uh, <laughs> do you know if the combined sewer storm water systems in New York City are changing in the future? Yes. Um... They're doing a number of things. One is, uh, they, you know, these, they're putting in these rain gardens and infiltration galleries and things like that to divert stormwater into the ground as opposed to into the stormwater system. They are also constructing, and probably not many people are aware of it, is this huge tunnel on the Brooklyn. Um, they're, they've got a tunnel boring machine down there carving into bedrock. Uh, essentially a storage tank for stormwater. So when you have a stormwater event, they divert the water into this tunnel to, to store it. So after the event, then they can pump it out and run it through the sewage treatment plant. Uh, so it doesn't overwhelm the treatment plant. And um, that's part of the solution. So yeah, they, they, they're working diligently on it. Okay, any more questions? All right, sounds like that might be it. Oh, wait, oh, uh, yeah, Brian Peterson raised his hand. Uh, you want to unmute yourself, Brian? Mute himself. <clears throat> Did you have a question, Brian? All right, I'm going to assume he's just waving to you, Paul. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, Chris, we have to go into some PDH questions. 
Indeed we do. And we're going to go there to the suite. Okay. Uh, we've got some trivia questions. <clears throat> you can follow along or you can answer in the chat box, but uh, they are topical. And uh, here we go, I think. Come on. <clears throat> okay, question one. How many times has New York City had a flash flood warning? And your answers are 11, 5, 3, one time. Um, our <clears throat> board member, Olivia Miller, works for EnviroTrack, was nice enough to put these together. So thank you, Olivia. And the answer is one time. Okay, number two. During the remnants of Ida in 2021, which Long Island city received the highest to total uh, of rain at approximately 7.5 inches? <clears throat> and your answers are Locust Valley, Lloyd Harbor, Port Wash, or Mount Sinai. <clears throat> I have no idea. I went off of data from NOAA, so if this doesn't check out with your experience, I apologize. Olivia, we're just thankful you put the questions together. It's all good. And the answer is Mount Sinai. All right. Question three. What year was the Long Island Express? This one I know. Well, I have a dumb question. Is that a storm? <laughs> it's a storm. Yeah, okay. it's, a it's, a it's a hurricane. I, I, I think I heard Paul mention it earlier. <laughs> the answer is the hurricane of 1938. And it was pretty rough on the island. Question four. Ah, another Long Island Express. The Long Island Express is known as the strongest hurricane to hit Long Island with winds up to 125 miles an hour, but which storm had comparable wind speeds at 120 miles an hour? And your choices are Esther, Carol, Donna, or Sandy. Come on, you Long Islanders, you should know this. The answer is Carol. 1954. All right, question five. Groundwater is threatened by rising sea levels as they are more prone to sea saltwater intrusion. Besides increased salinity to the water supply, what is another noted impact of saltwater intrusion? And your answers are changes in uh, parasites and waterborne illnesses. Lowered risk of flooding, rising groundwater table, and decrease in soil contaminants. And the answer is the rising groundwater table. Question six. While the most powerful storms tend to impact the New York State tri-state area, the third deadliest storm in New York history was concentrated on the southern tier. Which storm was this? Your choices are Agnes as a hurricane and tropical storms, Barry, Danielle, and Bill. And it's Agnes. Question seven, what factors are threatening Long Island's iconic oyster industry? Overfishing and destruction of habitat, change in water pH, nutrification, increased parasites due to warmer waters, or all of the above? I'm going with number four, and it is number four. I think we have 10 questions. Question eight, local birds have generally been more adaptable to climate change than aquatic life. Which bird made a notable comeback after conservation efforts were deployed? The piping plover, ospreys, the least tern, or the red-headed woodpecker? Tom Dwyer, I hope you get this one right. The answer is the osprey. All right, question nine. Sand dunes help protect the land behind it and 
from storm surges and flooding. How can dunes be protected? Your choices are promoting vegetation growth on the dunes, not disturbing the dunes, all of the above or none of the above. This should be easy for everyone. The answer is all of the above. Stay off the dunes. Question 10, while being the second most deadly hurricane in New York State history, an unexpected baby boom occurred nine months after yeah, Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> Hospitals reported increases of five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 25, and 20 to 25, 35%. I don't know where these questions come from. The answer oh. is, <laughs> Olivia, you can answer that in a minute, about 20 to 35%. Whoa. It was notable because they said that this appeared to be a higher baby boom than other previous natural disasters, which I found interesting. And that is, that is the end of the presentation. Um, Paul, thank you so much for doing it. We really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone for coming out. I think we're good at this point. Unless anybody has any other questions for Paul, we're gonna conclude the meeting. Great job, Paul. Thank you, we appreciate it. <clears throat> it's fun, I enjoy it. Okay, take care. Thanks, bye-bye.